really recommend all the young that's here who wants to be student knowledge to keep following him and listening to him in his talks, especially be one of his disciples. He has a lot of disciples all over the world <laughs> through his uh, YouTube channel, uh, Hadith Disciples. So uh, I really invite you guys to be uh, with some of his disciples and uh, benefit and uh, learn from him as much as you can, inshallah. So uh, I'm not going to be long. I don't want to bore you. Uh, as the young guy did when he threw dust on me. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Before that, inshallah, I'll pass the mic for Shaykh Muhammad, inshallah. Or we go from there. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mubarak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam tasliman mazidan amma ba'd. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as all thanks are for him, the mighty and the most high. And we don't have the ability to realize all of Allah's blessings. We don't have the ability if we wanted to. We don't have the ability as human beings with limited knowledge, with limited brain power. If we wanted to, we don't have the ability to realize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And even if we did... And even when we do think about some of Allah's blessings upon us, we still haven't finished. We're not done. That's just the beginning. Rather, we're actually going backwards as human beings, like a dog chasing his tail. You start in one place, you end up in the next place. And that is because for Allah to bless you, you owe Allah. That's a favor. <coughs> for you to realize that and acknowledge that, that's another favor. For you to have the ability to thank Allah and to praise Him for that favor is once more another favor. So it's like, like the modern day interest. You pay off one bill and you have another. You use one card to pay off a bill that pays off a what? Another. At the end of the day, you never ever make it out of debt. You never make it out of debt. Everybody understand this? You never truly make it out of debt but you're always in a constant circle, a revolving, a revolving wheel of debt. This pays that, which pays this, which pays that, which pays this. Everybody understand this? So Ibn Qayyim, rahim ta'ala, he explains how the slave can never ever do without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the slave can never ever be ungrateful to Allah the Mighty and the Most High. And the slave can never ever think that he has begun to repay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because him thinking like this, is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every time Allah blesses him, it increases his what? His debt. Increases his what? Increases his debt. He's in more debt to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can't even begin to believe how merciful, or to know, we can believe, we cannot begin to understand and to realize <clears throat> how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to all of us. Okay? For showing us the way and for allowing us and giving us the strength and the necessary patience and perseverance to tread that way. Ibn Qayyim, rahim wa ta'ala, he speaks on this in many of his books. And he talks about the concept of tawfiq. When you say to someone, bit tawfiq. Or you say to someone, wafaqak Allah. Or you say, when you graduate, your teacher says, muwafaq insha'Allah. What does tawfiq mean? Ibn Qayyim, rahim wa ta'ala, he summarizes everything that I just said about realizing, being in debt, getting out of debt and going into another debt to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says a tawfiq, he says, أَنْ يَدُلُّكَ عَلَى الْحَقْ أَوْ عَلَى الطَّعَى وَنْ يُعِينَكَ عَلَيْهَا He says the tawfiq, true success, divinely inspired success, is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show you the truth, to put you on the path of the truth, to steer you in the direction of the truth, and then help you in implementing and acting upon that truth. So Allah is showing you the path that is a favor, Allah assisting you and helping you on that path is once more another what? It's another favor. So you never ever get out of it. And this is the relationship between the slave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's never a time in which you can do without Allah the mighty and the most high. And this is from the wisdoms 
why there are sins that the slave makes, that the slave falls into, that are decreed upon him for the purpose of him never ever forgetting his human imperfection. And for him never ever to forget his need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Messenger of Allah has clearly explained to us the importance of istighfar. And that if you think that you're perfect and you're never going to fall into a sin and you're never going to fall into a mistake, Allah Azza wa will bring another people who would fall into a mistake. And these people would realize their need for Allah, they would ask Allah for forgiveness and Allah will forgive them. So the importance of realizing the nature of the relationship, that I'm a servant, I can strive for perfection, I am to strive for perfection, but I cannot reach that perfection. And even if I did, I can never ever do without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's never a time in which I'm above thanking Allah and being indebted to Him, the Mighty and the Most High. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahim Allah ta'ala, he also says, discussing the concept of al-Qadr, of the pre-decree, the divine destiny, and how the different people who attributed themselves to Islam, whether they were Muslims or not, they differed with regards to the Qadr. Some of the early Muslims, many years ago, they said that there's no Qadr. There's no such thing as Qadr. There's no predestiny. And the reason why they said this, the reason what would force them and cause them to take this opinion and this view, was that they said if there was Qadr, then that means Allah Azza wa will punish his slaves unjustly. You make a sin, you fall into disobedience, and then Allah sends you to the fire of hell, and Allah decreed it upon you. And that's zulm. And Allah Azza wa Jal munazahun an zulm. Allah is free from any type of wrongdoing or oppression. Wala yafulmi rabuka ahadan. So therefore, they can't be no qadr. And then there was another group of people who said that they were Muslims, and they made a total reactionary stance. They were on the other side of extremism. They were running from this ugly stance, and they said, there is qadr, no doubt. And there's so much qadr that you don't have any option or any free will or any choice to your deeds. There is no choice for what you do. Allah has decreed everything. So much so that the human being, the servant, the obedient, the disobedient, etc., he's nothing more than like a flag that blows in the wind, uh, a twig or a branch that is moved by the wind. You have no free choice. There is no option to obey or to disobey. Allah decrees it upon you, and then that's it, khalas. And obviously we know that there was a group from the people that were Muslims, and they said, we neither agree with the first group, absolutely, nor do we agree with the second group, absolutely. However, there is qadr. Things are decreed. Things have been written. But the slave has a clear will. The slave has the clear ability to think, to discern, and to choose between right and wrong, good and bad, hot and cold. The slave clearly has the ability to do this. Once the slave decides and has the uh, thought to do something and he's allowed to do it, he realizes that that was his qadr. And once the slave intends to do something, good or bad, and he doesn't do it, and he's unsuccessful, he fails at that act, he also realizes that that was qadr. And it wasn't written for him to make that act, good or bad. So the point is, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahim al ta'ala, he says that these are the three main groups with regards to qadr among those who say that they're Muslims. And he said, from the issues that pertain to this topic, is al-ihtijaju bil qadr ala fi'l al-ma'asi. Is using the qadr as an excuse to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Using the qadr to disobey Allah azza wa as an excuse, as a legitimate reason. I have to make this sin because Allah made it upon me. I continue to make this haram act because Allah, He decreed it upon me. Are you differing? Are you saying that Allah didn't make qadr upon everything? Are you saying that? So many people, they begin to do this. And some of them, they use the delil and the evidence, the argument between Musa alayhi salam and Adam. When Musa alayhi salam said to Adam, as the Prophet has informed us in the Sahih, that he says, you kicked us out of paradise, basically. We live in this land of suffering, of agony, of pain. All of the problems that we go through is because of your disobedience to Allah Azza wa in Jannah. And we know that Adam alayhi salam, he says, are you blaming me for a sin that I made? Are you blaming me for an error and a mistake that I fell into that Allah had decreed upon me before such and such a time? It was qadr. It was decreed for me to eat from the tree. It was decreed for me to listen to the whispers of shaitan and for me and for my wife to be removed from Jannah and all of the progeny remain upon this earth. Everybody understand this? 
So the Prophet said that Adam defeated Musa in this debate. Adam defeated Musa in this debate. Ibn Qayyim Ta'ala, he says it is incorrect for a person to use the Qadr as an excuse to disobey Allah. It's incorrect. And this was the proof and the evidence of the mushrikeen. They use an excuse to make shirk and to make fahisha what Allah Azza wa has made upon them. And Allah Azza wa Jal, he refuted that claim. That Allah, لا يأمر بالفحشاء Allah doesn't command you to do فحشاء أتقولون على الله ما لا تعلمون Do you say about Allah that which you don't know? قُلْ أَمَنَ رَبِّي بِالْقِسْطِ Allah, he says this in the Quran, refuting these people. But the main point that I want to get to right now to show you the importance of having a connection with Allah and that you can never ever truly repay Allah is the last part of this argument. And that is what Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah has said. That if a slave made a sin, if he disobeyed Allah, and then he left off that sin, and he made a sincere repentance, and afterwards he was upright and he was steadfast, and he had regret and remorse, Ibn Qayyim said it is permissible for him to say, Allah had decreed it upon me. And not to blame himself and kill himself over something that's in the past. It's done. I've made repentance. I've washed my hands. And it's permissible for him to say that that act of disobedience that I was making was what? Was khadr. Which it actually is. And there's a huge difference between saying what happened in the past as a reality and using it as an excuse for present and future disobedience. We all understand this? There's a world of a difference. Present and future disobedience saying it's qadr. So let me keep making the sin. That's clearly wrong. But to clearly establish and say this sin that I made 10 years ago, I've left it alone. I've walked past it. I'm clean. And it was clearly what, Samir? It was Qadr. It was what? Qadr, bila shak. But not in the current time. So the point is for the slave to have a constant relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of the time. And then you can never ever do without Allah the mighty and the majestic. And you never know what the secrets of Allah's qadr truly are. Allah may decree something upon you. A calamity, an affliction, a sin, an error, this and that. You don't know why. What's important is that you try your best and strive for perfection. As many of the Salaf al-Salih used to say. Some say it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Al-Qadru sirullah. Fala nakshifu. They said the qadr is the secret of Allah, so we don't try to unveil this secret. We don't try to unveil this secret. So therefore we ask Allah Azza wa to make us of those who are grateful and appreciative. We beg that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to understand some of what he has given us and to try our best to put forth the necessary payments for all of these amassing debts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon us now, the blessing of Islam, the blessing of youth, the blessing of wealth, the blessing of peace, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing. You can't begin thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of his blessings. <laughs> So therefore, with that being said, um, as has been announced, the topic of our discussion, <clears throat> the topic of our lecture, our meeting, our dars, our session, our cipher, is going to be on being just between your children. Justice, equality, fair treatment between one's children in light of the book and the sunnah, in light of the Qur'an and in the sunnah. And we will talk about its observance, its violation, and the effects of both thereof. Once more, fairness or fair treatment, just treatment, equal treatment between one's children in light of the Quran and the Sunnah. We wish to talk about when this treatment or this justice is upheld, when the parents observe this law. And also when the, or this practice isn't upheld, it's violated. And what are the effects, good and bad? What happens when you treat your children justly? What happens when you treat your children equally, when you're supposed to treat them equally? What happens when you have outward favoritism, etc.? What are the effects of this? So, as the topic clearly says, one's children. And also we say, or one could possibly say, one stepchildren as well, if you have a stepchild. Something that many people dislike and many people scorn and turn their nose up at having a stepson or stepdaughter. Rather, in al-haq yuqal, the reality is to be said, many people, they won't marry a woman if she has a child 
or if she was in a previous marriage and they look down upon her, her own family would look down upon her as if she's unchaste. Okay? And we claim to be upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah, he married women that had children. He married women that were not virgins. He married women that were widows, women that were older, and the list goes forward. And this is nothing more than a simple, sheer example of how far much of the cultural practice of many Muslims today, if not most, is far from the sunnah of the Prophet. Far from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. Is it preferred for a young man to marry a young woman, to marry a woman who's a virgin, so on and so forth? That's not the issue of discussion. The point is, a righteous woman, she's righteous upon kitab and sunnah. She could be beautiful, she could be knowledgeable, she could have beautiful character, and a man won't, won't marry her, or he may want to marry her, but his parents will say, no way. For the sheer fact, her sin, the sin that she made, is that she was married and she has a child. The husband that she could have had could have been a bad husband, he could have been wicked, could have been totally incompatible. It was not her fault, she was the best wife possible. So she's now labeled and stamped with that sin for the rest of her life. She has a son, khalas. That's very unfortunate and sad to show the ignorance of many of us today and how we claim to be upon Muhammad's way, but in actuality we're like night and day from Muhammad's way. So the Prophet ﷺ, he has stepchildren. How did he treat his stepchildren? Did he tell them verbally or physically that you're not from my loins, so I'm not going to treat you a certain way? Did he allow them to get away with certain things, not to be too harsh to them because they aren't my children? Or did he treat them and raise them and educate them and travel with them like his own children? So what's important is the topic says to be just, to be fair, to be equal between one's children, i.e. from your actual bloodline. And one may also say anyone who's in your house as if he's your child or she's your child from stepchildren as well. Regardless whether it's mandatory or not. In light of the book and the sunnah. Not in light of the speech of this person. The kalam of this one. The understanding of this. La. We said in light of kitab and sunnah. That's it. Huh? In light of kitab and sunnah. And everything that branches off from the kitab and the sunnah. The sahaba. Their understanding. The early Muslims. Their practice. How the ulama of Islam. The scholars of Islam have the detailed sciences and fields of extracting and deducing and explaining and categorizing and summarizing the kitab and the sunnah. In the light of the book and the sunnah, the speech of the ulama, the understanding of the Sarah Salih, what the Sahaba said and did, all of those things are extracted and deduced from the kitab and from the sunnah. Okay? Khayran, inshallah. Uh, and as a, a fa'idah, Sheikh Mufi, rahimahullah ta'ala, as he said in the introduction of. Uh, Asarim al Munki fi Rad al Subki, okay, in which the tahqiq was made by Al Maqtari, he said, speaking about the Kitab and the Sunnah, he says, Wahum al Kafilani li Radi Kulli Batinin. He says, The Kitab and the Sunnah are guaranteed insurance to refute each and every type of falsehood. Right, with that being said, we said the observance. And the violation and its effects. Khairun, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, with that being said, uh, we want to talk about the ruling of being fair to one's children or among one's children. The ruling of being just. And also the ruling of treating one's children equally. Is it obligatory for a person to be equal to his children? Question. Is it obligatory if I have five children, treat all of them equally? It's not obligatory? It is or it isn't. It is. It's obligatory or not? Yes? Tell anybody say no, that it isn't obligatory? Awali? It's not obligatory. Why not? Tell it says a boy and a girl, they aren't equal. You guys agree with Awali on this? You agree on this, Sahi? You agree on this or not? You agree with this or not? You're thinking, طيب. 
يو جيفن سامر توافق اوالي طيب خير ان شاء الله everybody you agree with this is that the boys and the girls aren't equal or they aren't to be treated equally everybody agree on this طيب خير ان شاء الله as a faida very important question اوالي جزاك الله خير for answering the correct answer is that it's neither yes or no yes or no from one aspect a person doesn't have to treat his children equally regardless of boy or girl and from another aspect, one does have to treat his children equally, regardless boy or girl. Why does a person have to treat them equally with regards to what? Why? What is the yes part of the answer? Providing for them, their basic needs. And what is the no part of the answer? Things that they can and cannot do, such as? Such as? It's so simple, she's got to tell us. <laughs> Boys traveling by themselves without a mahram. Girls? It's a tough one. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Very important faida as Sheikh bin Uthaymeen rahimahullah explains in the Sharh of Al Aqidah al Wasitiyah. He said that there's a difference between justice and equality. There's a difference between a taswiyah wal adl. Justice is for me to give everybody what they deserve. I have to give everyone what they deserve. Equality means that I have to treat everyone equally on the same. You see this now, Awali? So let's say, for example, I have to be just to my children. I have to give them the basic needs, as you said. Boy, girl, older, so on and so forth. Righteous, wicked, doesn't matter. But do I have to treat my daughter, who prays all night, who's memorized the Quran, who fasts, who's righteous, who's dutiful, who's observant, do I have to treat her equally like my son who oversleeps for the Salat al-Fajr? He has a girlfriend, he smokes weed, he gets tattoos, he doesn't pray, he's disrespectful, he curses, he brings drugs into the house. Do I have to treat them equally? Easy or not? You're setting yourself up by saying easy and simple. That's not what you said, Awali. That's, 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 <laughs> that's why I said you can't be equal to both. You can't be equal. Tahir. Everybody agree on this on difference between justice and equality? Yeah. Everybody agree or not? We agree or not? Yeah. Tahir. Once more, it's yes and a no. There's certain issues in which people have to be what? Equal, no doubt. And there are other things in which there isn't a condition for equality, but it has to be at least what? Justice. Justice. If I have 10 students, nine of them are lazy and lethargic, excuse makers, and one of them is very diligent, do I have to treat all 10 equally? Like the, right, like the diligent one? Maybe I do, depending on what that thing is. Depending on what? Depending on what it is. Type. So therefore, we're going to talk about the ruling of this issue. Is it mandatory to be justice or to be just between your children? Is it mandatory to be uh, equal, etc.? Number two, the second main point is the categories. Aqsam al mufadala wal adad wal taswiyah. The different ways and manners or the different scenarios in which me as the parent, I have to or I don't have to be just between my children. Hmm, Hishan? Times in which I have to and times in which I what? Don't have to. Number three, the reasons behind this issue, this problem. Why does a father or a mother treat some children in a way without the others? Why did, why did dad always treat you better and not us? Why is that? It has to be a reason why. Human behavior, it has to be a reason why. He gave us better treatment, he gave you better treatment, he didn't like us for a reason. Once we know some of those reasons, perhaps in the night title, we can get out of that problem in the times and the scenarios in which we actually have to get out of. After that comes the ha the fruits of being just, the benefits that you reap as a parent, as a father and a mother, and also the benefits that your children reap, the things that they get from your just treatment, your fair treatment, and your equal treatment, benefits in this life, benefits in the grave, and benefits in the hereafter. Last but not least is the exact opposite, adraruhu, is the harms. 
the vices and the bad fruits that come from you not being just among your children. You not being just and fair and equal among your children. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. So with that being said, uh, first and foremost is the ruling. What is the ruling of this whole entire issue? Ibn Qudama rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَلَا خِلَافَ بَيْنَ أَهْلِ الْإِنْ فِي اسْتِحْبَابِ التَّسْوِيَةِ وَكِرَاهَةِ التَّفْضِيلِ Ibn Qudama, he says, there is no difference among the ulama. There is no madhab. Shafi'i, Maliki, Hamali, Zahiri, there's no difference among the ulama as that being equal among your children is recommended and preferred. Is recommended and preferred. And there isn't any difference of opinion among any alim is that treating some like this and others like that is disliked. Is that it is disliked. So the scholars of Islam, according to this quote, they agree on something. They agree on the basic starting point. Is that it is a good thing to be just to your children. It is a good thing to treat your children equally. And it is a bad thing to do the opposite. Does this mean that they say it's mandatory and obligatory? No, he never said that. Does it mean that it's haram to treat one child in a way and not the other? He never said that. He said all of the ulama agree on what? One thing, and that is the basic concept is that it's a good thing or a what? Bad, Bad thing. You with me, Awali? Then the ulama, they differ on is it obligatory and haram. All of them agree that it's a what? A good thing. They agree that it's a what? Good, good thing. thing. And they all agree that it's a what? Doing the opposite is a what? A bad thing. Is every act of good mandatory in a religion? Ascent. No, it isn't. Is every bad thing in a religion haram? Something that's looked down upon. Everything? No. There are things which are makruh. Things that aren't good to do. But it isn't necessarily what? Haram to do. Everybody understand this? Everybody with me or not? Everybody's attention? Once more, the good in Islam is of how many categories? How many categories of good in Islam are there? Two. What are those categories? Quick, quick, Akhi. Wajib and Mustahab. Sunnah is all good. Huh? Wajib and Mustahab. Very good. Two types of good things in Islam. The first is what? Wajib. That which is good in you, have to do it. Number two, that which is good in you, what? You, do, you should do it, but you don't? Everybody with me or not? The good acts in Islam are of how many types? How many categories? Two. The first is called what? Wajib. <clears throat> is making five slots next. Is that a good thing? Without a doubt, it's a good thing. And it's also a? Obligatory thing. Making the recommended prayers before or after the daily prayers. Are those good prayers or not? Without a doubt. Ben Allahu, huh? Ben Allahu lo baitin fil jannah. No question. Do you have to make the rawatib? Do you have to make two before fajr? Do you have to make two before dhuhr? Do you have to make two after dhuhr? Do you have to do those things? No, you don't. No, you what? No, you don't. So therefore, the good things in Islam are of two types. Awadi, we said, right? Wajib and what? Mustahab. Are you back doing this or not? Now, the bad things in Islam are of how many categories? Two. The first is called? Haram. And the second is called? Makruh. Things that are bad. They're both bad. One type of bad, you what? You must avoid. And the second type of bad, you what? You should avoid, but you don't necessarily have to avoid. Everybody understand this or not? So we have four things now, four letters. A, B, C, D. The ulama of Islam agree on how many letters? And what letters are they? Nope. No way. We have four letters, A, B, C, and D. Four letters. They agree on B in? No. What is, what, what is D? D is what to you? Ascent. They agree on letter B and letter what? Letter D. Or if you want to spin it in an easier way, you can say A is wajib, B is mustahab, C is makruh, and D is haram. So the ulama of Islam, according to what we read, they agree on what letters? B and C. Treating your children equally, being just, being fair to your children is a what? 
is a what thing? Is a what thing? A good thing to do. No one differs that you shouldn't do it. Clear on this? And they also agree that not treating your children equally and fairly is a bad thing. Something that you shouldn't do, but it's not necessarily haram. Everybody understand this or not? That is what all of the ulama agree on. So therefore, after we, we have home, home, home base, home plate, we have first base. Are there any scholars of Islam who say that it is mandatory? Are there any scholars of Islam who say that it's haram to be unfair and unjust to your children? A taswiyah, to treat them equally, 100% in everything that you give them. Everybody clear on the sana. Those who say that it's mandatory, it doesn't go against the opinion of all of them saying that it's what? Obligatory. Tight. All right. So let's make an example because I think we're a little lost. Making two raka'ah when you come in the masjid. You enter the masjid. Can you sit down or are you allowed to make two raka'ah before you sit down? Abu Qatad narrated that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا دَخَلْ أَحْدُكُمُ الْمَسْجِدِ فَلَا يَقُدْ حَتَّى يَرْكَعْ رَكَعْتَيْنِ Hadith is in the Sahihain. When one of you enters the masjid, he shouldn't sit down until he does what? Two raka'ah. We agree with this or not? So, I say, I say that it's haram for you to sit down before you make two raka'ah. I say that you must make what? Before you sit down. And Hishan, you say that it's not mandatory, but it's what? Recommended. It's not haram to sit down when I'm making turaka, but it's just makru. So are we agreeing on something 100% or not? But we are agreeing on what? <laughs> We're agreeing on that making turaka before sitting down is a what thing? A good thing. But my goodness is a, is a notch up. Everybody clear on this? And it's bad to sit down without making two rakah. We both agree on that or not? But my badness is on a what? An intenser notch. My, my view of bad is that's haram. And you get a sin if you don't. His view of bad is something that you shouldn't do. It's unnecessary for the Muslim to leave off the sunnah. It's only a sunnah as we say today. It's just a sunnah. No, that's not a good thing at all. You should always try to do everything that you can. But if you can't or you just don't want to, then it isn't. Haram. Everybody understand this? So all of the ulama, they agree on what point is that it's a what thing? Good thing. And doing the opposite is a what? Bad thing. And then they differ on the intensity of good and on the intensity of bad. Everybody clear on this or not? So therefore, there are two main views that we'll deal with, inshallah. And the first view is, is that it is mandatory to be equal, to be just among all of your children. Period. Without any exception. And this is the view of many of the ulama of Islam, such as, we'll mention the later scholars later on, from the earlier ulama in the traditional madhahib, is the ulama of the Hanbali madhahib. Also the ulama of the Zahiri madhahib. They held the view that it's mandatory and the opposite is haram. And the other ulama who held the view is that it's also mandatory to be just and equal to your children. It's haram to do the opposite unless in maslah shara'iyah, unless there's a reason. Such as one of your children is what? Extremely diligent. One of your children is extremely righteous and dutiful. One of your children has a specific need. But if that isn't the case, then it goes back to the first opinion. Everybody clear on this or not? Everybody understand this? What's the proof for this? We have two ways or two types of proofs. The first type of proof is a general proof. Abdullah ibn Umar has narrated in the Sahih. That the Prophet ﷺ said, In the Vulma, Vulumatun Yomun Qiyamah. He said that Vulm, wrongdoing, is darkness on the day of judgment. You seek Allah fi awladikum. Allah says in the Quran that Allah gives you advice pertaining to your awlad. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ma min abdin, yastari'ihi la hurayyatan, falam yahutha bi nasihatin, illa harramahu Allah ala na. He says, There isn't a slave of Allah who is in charge of a group of people. And he isn't just, he isn't transparent, he's not righteous, except that he will not go to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ says, كُلُّكُمْ رَائِنْ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَيَّتِهِ Each and every one of you is a leader, each and every one of you is a shepherd, and each and every one of you is held responsible for his or her flock, his and her subjects. So these are all general proofs and evidences to be just to your children and to initially treat them what? Equally. 
There's the general proofs. As far as the specific proofs, then the asal, the most important evidence for this, the most specific delil, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala has collected, and Imam Muslim has also collected, and we're going to read it directly from Sahih Muslim for a reason, the specific wordings that I want to share with you. Imam Muslim, he says, حَدَثْنَا يَحْيَى بْنُ يَحْيَى قَالَ قَرَأْتُ عَلَى مَالِكٍ عَنْ إِبْنِ شِهَابٍ عَنْ حُمَيْدِ بْنِ عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ وَعَنْ مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ النُّعْمَانِ بْنِ بَشِيرٍ يُحَدِّثَانِهِ عَنْ النُّعْمَانِ بْنِ بَشِيرٍ أَنْهُ قَالَ إِنَّ أَبَاهُ أَتَى بِهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَقَالَ إِنِّي نَحَلْتُ إِبْنِي هَذَا غُلَامًا كَانَ لِي فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أو كل أو كل ولدك نحلته مثل هذا فقال لا فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فرجعه إما مسلم وريدين من صحيح مسلم نفس من صحيح بخاري is reported by نعمان بن بشير نعمان بن بشير is the companion narrator what hadith what famous hadith from نعمان بن بشير what famous hadith did نعمان بن بشير report we can't answer this question in Abu Huraira Center أيوة إن الحلال وإن الحرام وبينهما أيوة everyone should know this what like that ها طيب نعمان بن بشير he narrated that one day his father was with the messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام and he brought نعمان with him and he said to the messenger of Allah oh messenger of Allah I had a servant a young man a young boy that was a servant and I gave this servant to my son as a gift. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, did you give it to all of your sons? Did you give all of your sons a servant? Did you give all of them something? The man, uh, his father, Bashir, he said, no. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, farji'hu. He says, then take the gift back. He told the companion to do what? To take the gift back. I.e., he did not condone his gift for what reason? It wasn't what? Equal to who? The brothers of Bashir, or of Nu'man. So the Prophet ﷺ, he clearly censured him for doing what? Giving one son something without giving the what? The others. So this is the primary evidence for this whole entire issue. Of those who say that it's mandatory to be what? Equal. Those who say that it's recommended to be what? Equal. You got me, Awali? There's another version of Sahih Muslim in which the same story is mentioned, and the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Fardudhu. He says, return it, reject it. The gift is no more. There's a third narration. He says, Faruddahu. He says, take it back. There's a fourth narration, and this is a very important narration. Listen carefully. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, kullihim. He says, have you done this with all of your sons? He said, no. He said, وَعْدِلُوا فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ فَرَجَعَبِي فَرَدَّ تِلْكَ الصَّدَقَةِ The Prophet says, have all of your sons been given this gift? Obviously he said no. The Prophet wasallam he said, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ He said, fear Allah and be just among your children. So we see that one hadith has several different what? Versions. This version is one of the most complete versions because it doesn't just say take the gift back. Maybe Nu'man didn't need the gift and the other brothers did. Maybe, maybe, maybe. This version clearly lays down a general what? A general what, Ikhwan? A general what? Rule. And that rule is what? To have taqwa of Allah and then what? Among the children. And that it isn't specific to this one specific situation. Everybody understand this? If I asked your father, I say, Ya Sheikh, have you given all of your sons this gift? And you say what, Sheikh? You say what? You say no, right? I say take back the what? Take back the gift. Maybe the other sons didn't need what? The gift that he gave you. Maybe you have a specific need. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But if I say, Ittaqillah, fear Allah, and be just among your children, my speech then applies to what? Every single what? Not every single child, every single what? Situation. A car, money, anything. Fear Allah, me what? Just to your children. That isn't the same as me speaking on one specific what? <coughs> Situation. Everybody, we understand this or not, guys? Everybody with me? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Farduthu. He says, take the gift back. Maybe the son that he gave didn't need the yeah. gift. Yeah. 
But this other version of the hadith teaches us that it's a general rule. It's a general what? It's a general rule. How do we know it's a general rule? He said, fair law and do what? Among your and each and every single situation. A little bit of money, a lot of money. Everybody clear this? You clear this, Awali? Moving forward, Imam Muslim. He has another narration. Listen carefully. He says, he says, did you give this gift to all of your children? He says, no, I didn't. He says, did you give your children all of this? He said, no. He says, then don't bring me as a witness because I'll never ever bear witness to, un to injustice. I won't be a witness to jawr, to dhulm. And this version, once more, is even more thorough. And it shows giving one child something and not the rest of them is an act of what, Awali? Injustice. And how can injustice be disliked? How can being just and upholding justice be something that's only, that's only what? We, we just mentioned disliked. We just, Asenta. How can it be letter B? We said that it can't be letter C. Is dhul makruh? Is, is dhulm disliked? It's haram, without a question. It is disliked by Allah, but it's, that, it's the type of dislike which is what? Haram. Is it okay to be unjust, just a little bit okay? No. Is it just okay to be just, or you have the, the ability on to be just in what you do? So these narrations clearly prove the opinion that states that it's haram to give one something without the others. Even if there's a reason, is what is not necessarily the strongest view. It's not necessarily the what? The strongest view. And the strongest view is that it is haram and that being just and equal is also what? Mandatory. Fiqh, studying fiqh is like two mirrors. They always reflect on each other. The act that is mandatory to do, what's the reflection of that act? What's the reflection of the act? Asenta. If it's obligatory to do, then it's what? Haram not to do. If it's disliked to do, then in the reflection is that it's what? Recommended to do thee? Everybody understand this? Every single Muslim has to have a basic understanding of this type of fiqh. Every Muslim. Allah wants me to be just. Allah wants me to be honest. So that automatically means that Allah doesn't want me to be dishonest. Everybody clear on this? Allah loves strength. That means that Allah hates weakness. Allah loves cleanliness. That automatically means that Allah what? Hates dirt and lack of cleanliness. Whether I have a specific proof for it or whether I just have this general principle of two what? Mirrors. Always reflecting back and forth. Everybody got this or not? That which is haram to do, doing the opposite of it is what? Initially mandatory. So therefore, Ibn Qayyim, he says, uh, 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 regarding, this, uh, regarding this issue, Ibn Qayyim, he says here, Listen very carefully, be the night ta'ala. He says, Khairan, insha'Allah. We'll pull up the kalam of Ibn Qayyim regarding this issue and how it is mandatory and it isn't something which is an issue of an option. He says, لَوْ لَمْ تَأْتِ السُنَّةُ الصَّحِيَةُ الصَّرِيحَةُ الَّتِي لَا مُعَارِضَ لَهَا بِالْمَنِئِ مِنْ لَكَانَ انْقِيَاسُ وَوْصُولِ الشَّرِيَةِ وَمَا تَضَمَّنَتُ مِنَ المصالح Ibn Qayyim says, if we didn't have a specific proof, what we just read, the story of what companion? Ibn? With his uncle, now, His father. His father was also a? His companion. He says, if we didn't have the specific evidence, he says, then the principles of Islam the principles of the Sharia, the general understanding of Islam would necessitate that it's what? Haram. To treat one child better than the? Others. To give a gift to one child and not give it to the what? Others. What are these general principles of the Sharia that he's talking about? Who can give me an example of these general principles? A general principle that will normally show that that's not even right to do that. Such as what? Yalla Awali, you, you're shooting good from the floor. You got to keep shooting. We need a three-pointer now. Huh? It's Toronto, right? Well, give me a general principle why, why it will be haram. 
Not a hadith, not the delayed campaign, a general principle. Quick. Yeah. Why that's wrong? Why that's haram? Huh? There you go. Number one. What is Islam's position regarding jealousy? Does Islam praise jealousy or, or blame jealousy? Which of the two? Everybody has to know this. I didn't say what's the ayah, what sort is it from, um, what's the dalil, man, la. The general rule that every Muslim should know is that Islam is against what? Jealousy. Every Muslim is supposed to know this. That Islam is against what? Jealousy. Clear on this or not? Islam is against what? Jealousy. Raise your hands if you don't know this as a Muslim. It's okay to be jealous and envious among people. Everybody is supposed to know this. Naam? Correct or incorrect? Right? Type. So what is going to happen, or what is the Islamic principle of a thing that leads to another thing? Speaking directly to you. This is a thing here. The thing isn't necessarily that bad, but it directly leads to this thing, which is clearly bad. What would this thing be now become? This thing would become a what? Haram. Even though it isn't necessarily what? Haram. But it's a direct doorway to the act that is? Haram. So therefore, jealousy, envy, malice in the hearts of the children... What's one of the seeds? What's the water, the flower pot that leads to that? Is when your father gives him something and not give the other for something. Oh, he likes him better. He, he's better than us. He thinks he's better than us. And now there's now what? Envy. envy. And envy in Islam is totally looked down upon. Everybody clear this or not? Another Islamic principle will be what? What is Islam's position on, on dutifulness to your parents? What's Islam's position on dutifulness to your parents? A good thing or a bad thing in Islam? Obligatory or optional to treat your parents kindly and dutifully? Which one? Obligatory. So therefore, you're giving one child one thing and not the, children, the rest of the children another thing, that is going to lead to what? Them not being dutiful to you. Everybody clear on this? And then there's principle after principle after principle after principle. The principle of brotherhood. These are all my sons. These are all my daughters. But they're also still what? They're Muslims. They pray. They make sujood. And I'm, how am I supposed to treat my Muslim brother? Huh? Last but not least, what is the Islamic ruling on scorning a Muslim? What is the Islamic principle of scorning a Muslim, looking down upon a Muslim? Because of what you look like. Or what he looks like. Or what you look like. Or how you talk or how you walk. What's the Islamic principle on this? Mandatory? This is supposed to be like what, guys? Clockwork. You guys got to participate. Musharaka. Huh? I'm not a normal lecturer. Everyone should know this. This is my third, fourth time here at Abu Awadi. When I give a class, I come to do what? Interact. It's not a, a lecture. I'm not here to, to, to lecture you. I'm not here to just talk, talk, talk and hear my voice. I want you to do what? Hands on. Everybody know this or not? Everyone knows this, inshallah. So therefore, Islam's position on scorning the Muslim is what, yaqeen? It's down. It's, it's bad. Whether it's haram or makruh. So when you give one child a gift, and you don't give the rest of the children a gift, one of the reasons which we're going to mention why I gave it to him and not the rest is because I do what with the other four sons? I scorn them, and I look at them with content. They don't look like me. They're boys. They're not girls. They don't take my advice. They're this, they're this, they're they take after their mother. But my one son and my one daughter that takes after me, here you go. Tafadl. Everybody understand this? I look at this one child as being what? Then the rest. If he's automatically higher, then the rest of them are automatically. And that is content. That's ihtiqar. He's better because he's from this country. You're better because you have a handsome face. He doesn't have a handsome face. Ugh. 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 I don't want you to come sit and eat lunch with me. No, please. No poor people, please, in the masjid. This is our approach. The poor Muslim, the rich Muslim, they're all supposed to be in certain things what? Equal. And they're supposed to be in certain acts treated what? Equally. And that's why the Prophet said, says, Sharul ta'am ta'amul walima. He says that's the worst type of food. The worst banquet is the banquet of the, of the walima. Why is that? Why is, the, why is the banquet of the walima so evil? Why is it bad? What did the Prophet say? The poor are kept back and the rich are invited. 
whose ribs are touching, or touchy as they say, seven. Which ones? The rich or the poor? Who needs the, the biha, the lamb and the camel and the, 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 the soup? and the, Who needs that? Who's hungry? When's the last time this poor person had a good, fine meal? When's the last time this rich, wealthy person had this what? Uh, guys, are we talking French or Spanish? What language am I speaking? German? This is supposed to be simple, basic common sense. When is the last time the poor person had a what? When's the last time the rich, rich person had a good meal? For breakfast, for lunch, the walim is at nighttime. He probably had a five, six course what? Meal. He took a couple of bites, a couple of pieces, and the rest, yurma, and trash. Everybody understand this? You ever experienced this? You go overseas. One time we were in Mecca, and we were in the hotel. It was Dar al-Tawheed. And one way or another, we were some brothers who had connections with the royal family of the UAE, Emirat. One of the guys there, he wasn't, he wasn't the, the sheikh of the UAE, but he was directly related and connected with the royal family. So they heard us talking in, in the hallway. He knew one of them. He says, come over for lunch. So it's me and a few other American brothers. We came in their hotel room. Mashallah, the hotel room. That's all I'm saying is mashallah. This is a crazy, crazy hotel room. It's like you're sitting inside of the Kaaba from the hotel room. So they're sitting around there talking, blah, 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 kether, kether, kether. Small talk, the normal pleasantries. I was uncomfortable. Some people were smoking cigarettes, so on and so forth. And this is nothing against the UAE. I'm not trying to talk about the UAE. Just, I'm, I'm telling a story in my life, okay? It's not a lie, all right? It's not against the UAE, this one, that one. Nothing for or against them. But this is a story. So they said it's time to eat. So, you know, we're poor students of knowledge. We're in Medina eating, you know, beans and rice. And if you get a chicken, you get rotisserie chicken, you, that's what? Am I making this up? Am I making this up? If you get a chicken, that's what? That's baraka. Let alone red meat, lamb and goat. That's, that's baraka. You ever live overseas in Medina? You go over to someone's house and this person is, even if they aren't wealthy, they come over to give you chicken and rice. It's like an insult. It's like a slap in the face. You're like a peasant. I don't even want you in my house if they don't give you red meat. It's well-known culture overseas in general, let alone in Saudi Arabia. But students that are hungry, you get chicken. It's like, oh, man, Allahu Akbar. This is an Eid. This is an Eid. We get huh, some Bukhari chicken and rice, huh, some kebsa, let alone some actual red meat, let alone a lot of red meat. So we're thinking they're going to bring a couple plates. They said, no, get up. We're going to another wing of the hotel, another section. They open up the doors. And it's literally a table from that wall until Allah Alam to the next wall. Each and every major platter is an animal in itself on the plate. A whole entire animal. Literally a whole entire animal. Not a noose, no. It's a, it's a kept, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a goat on every single plate. This colorful rice, this pink rice, green rice, everything with all the trimmings. So we like, Bismillah. So we start eating, scarfing the food down. This one, he takes a piece there. Takes a leg there, a bite there, a spoonful there, a spoonful there, some tea, some buckle of innocent, and that's it. They all get up and they go back to smoke cigarettes. And we're sitting there like, what the heck? You guys didn't eat. It was so much food. Was this the Eid? Was this a royal banquet? Was this someone's daughter getting married? This was a normal what, Samir? This is a normal, we said that's light, what? It's light cheese. This is a normal dinner. And to us, we couldn't even conceptualize and ponder how much food was in a simple, basic lunch, not even dinner. So the Prophet said to me, says, the worst food is the food of the what? The walima. Why is it the worst food? Because what? Those who need the food are not invited. Those who don't need the food or even want the food are invited. So scorning a Muslim is supposed to be something that's what? Bad. And one of the reasons why parents don't give their children equally is because they scorn some of their children. They look down upon them because of your complexion. You're supposed to have my complexion, not this complexion. Hmm? You're supposed to look like me, not, my mother, not your mother. You're supposed to be a lawyer, not a student of knowledge. Everybody understand this? He's actually a lawyer like me. He listened to me. He went to law school. You went to seek knowledge. So therefore, I'm going to punish you by you giving just a little, and I give the other one a what? A lot. So therefore, all of these negative things in Islam, they're haram. They're looked down upon. So when you give one child and not the rest, it all leads to that what? So this is what Ibn Qayyim is saying. If we didn't have the delay of Nu'man ibn Bashir, he says that the general principles will clearly prove that it's what? Everybody understand this. 
فهمنا كلام ابن القيم؟ We understand ابن القيم's speech or not? طيب, moving forward. With that being said, the correct view is that it is mandatory to be just among one's children with regard to that which you have the ability to be just in. And it also proves that it is haram to treat your children differently except for that which is a time in which you can treat them differently. Ibn Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, يَتَعَيَّنُ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَنْ يَعْدِلَ بَيْنَ أُولَادِهِ وَيَنْبَغِ لَهُ إِذَا كَانُ يُحِبُّ أَحَدَهُمْ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ غَيْرِهِ أَنْ يُخْفِي ذَلِكَ مَا أَمْكَنَهُ وَأَنْ لَا يُفَضِّلَهُ بِمَا يَقْتَضِي الْحُبْ مِنْ إِثَارٍ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْأَشْيَاءِ فَإِنُّ أَقْرَبُ إِلَى أَصْلَاحِ الْأَوْلَادِ وَبِرِّهِمْ بِهِ وَاتِّفَاقِهِمْ فِيمَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَلِهَذَا لَمَّا ظَهَرَ لِإِخْوَةِ يُوسُفْ مِنْ مَحَبَّةِ يَعْقُوبَ الشَّدِيدَةِ لِيُوسُفَ وَعَدَمْ صَبْرِي عَنْهُ وَانْشِغَالِهِ بِهِ عَنْهُمْ سَعَوْا فِي أَمْرِهِمْ وَخِيمٍ أَوْ سَعَوْا فِي أَمْرٍ وَخِيمٍ وَالتَّفْرِيقُ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَبِيهِ فَقَالُوا إِذْ قَالُوا لِيُوسُفَ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْنَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى بِنَا مِنَّا وَنَحْنُ أُسْبَةٌ إِنَّ أَبَانَا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ أُقْتُلُوا يُوسُفَ أَوْ اطْرَحُوهُ فِي أَرْضٍ يَخْلُو لَكُمْ وَجْهُ أَبِيكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ وهذا صريح جدا أن السبب الذي حملهم على ما فعلوا من التفريق بينه وبين أبي هو تمييزه بالمحبة انتهى كلام ابن سعدي رحمه الله تعالى شيخ سعدي he says regarding the story of Yusuf he says it is mandatory upon a person man or woman father or mother to treat his children equally and to be just as children he says yet ayan is mandatory and whenever a person is naturally inclined towards one of them more than the others, he naturally loves one of them more than the others, it's upon him to hide it as much as possible. That's natural. You can't help that. If you have five children, you love one more. It's natural. It's natural if you have six children, the first one you love more. You have five boys and you love the baby girl more than the boys. That's natural. You can't, you can't control that. Allah says, Allah doesn't give a man two breasts in his heart. You can't control that. But he says, if that is the case, then it is mandatory for him to make jihad. He has to fight that. He has to hide that as much as he can. And not to show his children that he's fonder of Abdul Rahman instead of the other five. Everybody understand this? He says, and the reason and the proof behind this is the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah clearly told us the only reason why they conspired against Yusuf, the only reason why they tried to kill him and get rid of him, the only reason why they wanted to split him from Yaqub was what? Is that he what? He loved Yusuf more than them. He was more busy. He was thinking. He was preoccupied with Yusuf. Don't take him out. Don't take him there. I'm afraid that a wolf will eat him. I'm afraid that you'll lose him. I'm afraid that you'll be irresponsible. Everybody understand this? It was clear and evident that his love towards Yusuf was what? Was greater. So what happened when he showed this or when it wasn't hidden? What happened? Shaitan came. Everybody Allah clearly says this. That the shaitan whispered and he caused them to make that what? Plot to throw him in the well and make up the lie with regards to the blood and with regards to the thob. Everybody understand this or not? So these are some of the texts and some of the speech of the, of a few of the ulama of the past with regards to the ruling type. The next section is aqsamuhu. The different types or categories. Awali, stay with me. When you have children, let's say you have five children, right? What types of things can you do for them financially? What are the, what are the categories? Not, the, not specific. I need a general category. A specific. I need more general. All right, let's say welfare. That's one. One type. Education is specific. Everybody doesn't have to be educated. Everyone doesn't have to go to school. You don't have to go to school. The Prophet can neither read nor what? Nor write. Everyone doesn't have to go to school. But everyone has to be have basic welfare. Sahih? Every child does not have to go to school. By here. Welfare is one. Now we're talking about financially. Financially. That's under welfare. Number two is what? That's welfare, Ikhwan. Shelter, food, all of that is welfare. Number two is what? Love, very good. But that's not necessarily with money. Think about something with one's money. What can I do with my children regarding my wealth? In other words, I buy my son a remote control, a remote control car. Is that his welfare or not? 
I sent. Thank you. It isn't his what? It's not his what? Is my son going to die if he doesn't have a remote control car? Is he going to starve? Is he going to be fr frozen? Is he going to get sick? That is not from the necessary what? We differ on this or, got, or not, guys? Is khilaf or am la? Hal al remote control min al la? Abadan. Hal min al that's That's from Kamal. That's tahseen. That is none pertaining to durura. Tafakr ala hadha wa la? Taib. The remote control car is not from welfare. So the first concept is welfare. Including the welfare is what? Food, drink, shelter, education if it's necessary. Number two is what? Asenta. As ata. As a gift. The gift is not from welfare. The, small, the remote control car, my son, does not need to do what? To live, to exist. Everybody clear on this? Number three is what? Inheritance. Nope. Because you don't give anything when you want to inherit. The people give it out. You're dead. Colossus. <laughs> Which you bequeath the will see a will. Can you give a will to your children? Uh, no, I don't think so. God gave them. Ha. Are children from the warata? What is that? No. They are from the warata. Samir. Are there people who inherit? Or you can put it in a will? لا وصيتا لوارث كما جاء في بعض الأثار unless that the heirs agree هذه أحكام المواريث very important many people make a mistake in this in America and Canada a will is not inheritance a will is not what? inheritance has nothing to do with you once you've passed on the Muslims divide your wealth a third, a half, a sixth, a kather, a kather, a kather that's it, it has nothing to do with you a wasiyah is a will that I write that I give Fulan a million dollars out of my wealth. I give Fulan this, this house. I give him this earth. And you're not a what? You're not originally a what? A wadith. You're not a wadith. It doesn't mean that you're not my family because every family member isn't a wadith. Every family member in Islam isn't an heir. Are you clear on this? The detailed rulings of inheritance. Ma'am? Every family member isn't a? Isn't an heir. So whether you're a family member or not, let's say you're a total stranger. I put in my will. What's your name, Akhi? Muhammad. When I die, give Muhammad my library. Don't, do not allow it to be split up among my sons. Give it to Muhammad. Muhammad isn't originally a what? An, an inheritor. Everybody understand? So we'll see a shay. What is it? For him to have that, what a laugh. A will is one thing, and inheritance is something totally what? Different. And this goes to show you some of the harms of the secular nominal society that the people live in. A will is not inheritance. I can leave everything for my wife. And my children get what? Nothing. That's dhulm in Islam. Moving forward. So we have welfare. And that's called welfare. An nafaka. An nafaka to wajiba. Food, drink, shelter, etc. Number two, we said a what? A gift. I sent. Three, we said a what? A will, we exclude that. What else can I give my children of monetary things? <laughs> Business, la, la. That's, that's, that, go, that's, that goes back to a gift. Money, well, that's what we're talking about. What type of money? What reason behind money? A reward. A jaiza. A what? A reward. Is a reward a gift? Yep. Is a reward a gift or not? No, it isn't. Anyone who wins the race gets a reward. Here, 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 I give you this pin. It's a gift. Did you win a race? Did you do anything? I, I want you to have a what? A gift. Everybody understand this? So we have a nafaka. We have what? A gift. And we also have a third, which is a what? A reward. So Awali, stay with me now. I'm passing you the ball, and then it's the fourth quarter. We need you to shoot the three to take the game home. Tahib. Is it obligatory for me to be equal among my children all three of these things? Yes or no? I didn't say anything about justice. I said equal. Yes or no? It is or it isn't? He says no. Why not? He did something extra out of the way. It was six children, one race. Only one person won it. Six children, one hadith to memorize. One Quran. He did it. And not the others. All right, so you say that the, the, the reward they don't have is no tasbih. What about a gift? 
I didn't say justice. I never said justice. I said equality. Has to be what? And if it's equal, does it doesn't mean that it's just? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. For me to treat a Muslim and a non-Muslim equally, that's not justice. You with me or not? It said a three-pointer, Akhi. Right. Last but not least is the nafaq al wajiba The mandatory welfare. That has to be what? Equal. Loving of my children. Now we're done with money now. Let's leave off money. Loving my children. Do I have to love all my children equally? Awali, yeah. yes or no? You can't? What if somebody can? Yes or no? Do I have to love all my sons equally? You have to show them. To nafiquhum, yani. To jamilhum. Oh, man. You put on a front for your kids. I love all of you the same. Uh-huh. Awali, yes or no? Do I have to love all my children the same? That's the question, Awali. It's one ball, it's one hoop. <laughs> so you can be an outwardly nifat with your kids? That's what that means, basically. There's a type of love that every child has to get because that's necessary. And if you don't give them a certain type of equal love, it will cause what? A major psychological damage. And there's other type of love that you said that he doesn't have the ability what? To do, even if he wanted to. A man has more than one wife. Does he have to love all of his wives the same? Yes or no? He doesn't. But he has to spend the time what? Money. Lodging. Equally. Is it, can you go over one wife's house and sit on your phone and text your other wife? And send her faces and smiley emojis. I can't wait to see you. Yeah, I miss you too. He's thinking about his first wife over at another wife's house. Can he do that or not? No. But he may be sitting with his second wife, drinking coffee. They may be about to go to sleep. And he's what? Can he control that initially? But he isn't supposed to what? Show it. And he is supposed to, he has to give her the necessary love and affection that she demands. According to the best of his ability. Even if it's more love and affection with the... Everybody clear on this or not? So we, bat- we basically understand that welfare is supposed to be equal, but even that's wrong. That's wrong as well. Hadha khata. The welfare of the children is based off of their needs. I have a son who's in college. I have a son who's in the fifth grade. Are their expenses the same, Hishan? No. Clearly not the same. I have a boy and I have a girl. Do I have to give them the same amount of money? Yes or no? Samir. Some of the ulama say, لِلذَّكَرِي مِثْلُ هَذِ الْهُمْ ثَيَيْنِ Tawafiq? 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 Huh? Tawafiq? That's another long issue with regards to inheritance. Alright, so everybody understand the differences now? The different types of equality and justice. Sometime it has to be what? 100%. And other times it what? Other times it what? It doesn't. I have twins. They're both in college. I have to both give them? Clearness or not? An older son in college and I have a two year old son. Do I have to give them the same amount of money? Well, how can that? Everybody understand this or not? All right, moving forward. Asbabu. What are the reasons behind unfair treatment, unequal treatment of one's children? Let's just try to wrap this up quickly. Huh? Yalla Awali. You're my go to guy. What are some of the reasons? I mentioned some of them for you already. We mentioned some of the reasons behind a father giving one child more than another. The first reason was what? Huh? Needs la This is a reality, whether we want to talk about it or not. The human being is weak. Huh? He has four sons. All three of them look like his, the, his ex-wife. He's no longer with the mother. They look just like her. Just like her. Hunter spit an image of her. They even act like her. And he has one son that looks just like what? Him. If he doesn't have a good amount of iman, now we're keeping it real now. There's no sugar. There's no glaze. This is, let's be realistic now, okay? If he doesn't have a good amount of iman and faith and taqwa, and he's a just person, it's possible for him to look down upon the other what? Children. Because every time he looks at his other three sons, he thinks about his ex-wife. And what they went through and how he, he made the face just like my ex-wife makes. But my one son looks just like... Me, so I'm going to give him more. That's a scenario. Looking down upon the what? The other son. Tight. What's another reason, quickly? 
Huh? Love. Taib, another reason quickly? Something that's blameworthy. No. Male and female. Male and what? Female. I like boys better than girls. So I give my son much more money and I give my daughter what? Less money. Why? I'm implementing an ayah or just because of what? Jahiliyyah. Because of what? Because of jahiliyyah times. That the boy is better than the girl. Because of the Quran, that a woman gets half of the man's portion? No. But because of what? Jahiliyyah. Because of jahiliyyah. That the boy is totally superior than the girl. Or the exact opposite. I don't like boys. A, a mother, she gives the daughter more than the son. Or vice versa. Everybody clear on this? Another reason behind this is age. Because this person's older, I automatically give them more. Not based off of needs. We, we're done with that. And to hate them in the needs. Needs khalas. We're talking about just share, huh? Negativity in one's heart. Everybody clear on this or not? You got me, Awali? Moving forward. Tayyab. Um, also, we have Al Jamalu Al Khilqa. Beauty, handsomeness. I have five sons. One of them is very, very handsome. And the other four are what? Aren't really that handsome. Whether it's an issue of complexion, features, or any other type of jahili reason. Everybody clear on this? This is a reality. We can act like it doesn't exist, but it what? It does, without a question. Everybody understand this? Tight. Moving forward, um, what are some of the effects when you're just between your children? Some of the benefits that you get quickly. We've been sitting down for a while, I know. It's been it. Huh? They become dutiful to who? To the parents. That's one, but that's too vague. Their brotherhood remains strong, like the story of Yusuf. If their brotherhood is strong, what can they accomplish? What will happen to the family business when I go? I have five sons, and all of them have partnership in the business. What's going to happen to my business? Is it going to flourish and grow? Or is the business going to crash because of internal fighting and rivalries? Which one, Aki? Which are the two? When dad goes, what are the other four brothers going to do now? They're going to get revenge. They're going to fight. I'm better than you. I was always smarter than you. Even though Abby thought you were the smartest, I'm the smartest, and I'm going to prove it right now. I was always the strongest. But Abby loved you more because you were weak. You were the youngest. You were spoiled. And I'm going to now show you and prove to the whole world my what? My physical domination. Everybody clear on this? Killing my brother. This is well known in all of the books of history. People fighting for, for the throne. That's why the ulama, they say, what? The things which prevent a person from inheritance is what? It's murder. Hastening someone. I want to kill you to get your money. Kill you to take your money. Everybody understand this or not? So the father has now a direct touch on the blood now. It's his fault why the sons are fighting and destroying the family business because of what? He wasn't just. So this goes to show you how the spiritual things in Islam have an effect upon the prosperity of the material things in the dunya. Pay close attention. Everybody just stay with me, huh? Before we stop. I'm a father. I have five sons. I have a major business. The person to take this business from me is supposed to be my what? My sons. All of them are interested in the family business. I've trained all of them. They all have shares. Because I treated this one son so differently than the rest, what's going to happen when I die to the family business? Why is it going to crash? Because they're incompetent of doing the job? Because I didn't train them because of internal fighting? How many dynasties and empires in history were destroyed because of what? Internal what? Fighting. This brother kills this brother for the throne. He assassinates him. He Everybody understand this? So this is one of the major harms. Ty, what are the benefits of treating your children justly and equally? Quickly, this is the last part that we'll mention tonight, inshallah. Is what? Is the exact opposite of the? No. The exact opposite of the what, Samir? هذه قاعدة إخوان الثمار أو الأضرار تكون عكس ليش الثمار كل ضرر يكون عكسه إيش ثمرة from the benefits or from the harms of not being just is that they will what have envy from the benefits of being just is that inshallah it will stifle the envy from the harms of not being just is that they won't cooperate upon bitter and taqwa from the benefits of being just is that they will 
upon bidr and taqwa. Everybody Last but not least, the most important of these things, brothers and sisters, is you being unjust to your children is a reason behind your children leaving in Islam. And if they don't leave Islam, then them deviating from the Sirat al Mustaqim. Speak to most people who leave Islam, or most people who stop practicing the Sunnah, or the sister she took off her hijab, and he got a girlfriend, he started making zina, and the illegitimate children. Most of them, if you sit down and talk with them, you find they have major damage and pain from their childhood. Many people, they get tattoos to demand attention from their parents. My Abby never pays attention to me. I'm busy. Mashgul, malish. I have a business meeting. I have to travel here. I have to go there. I have to do this. I have a softball game. I can't make it. I have a karate tournament. I can't make it. The young daughter has a ballerina demonstration. I'm sorry. I can't make it. Come read this book to us, Abby, before you go to sleep. But bedtime story. I'm sorry, what? I can't make it. I get up early in the morning. If you don't give your, your children the attention, oftentimes the children will do what? They'll steal the attention. Now you're going to pay attention to me. Now you're going to do what? You're going to pay attention to me now. I got this crazy tattoo on my neck. Now you're going to notice me. You never cared about me before, so now I have a boyfriend. Or I get married to somebody that you consider to be despicable of another race or another color. Now you're going to do what? You're going to pay attention to me now. Everybody clear on this? Everybody understand this or not? So this is basic psychology in Islam and outside of Islam. Most people, they go away from the Sirat al-Mustaqeem or oftentimes because of some type of pain or injury to their what? Their childhood. And the asal of pain and injury in one's childhood is how one's parents treat them and how they look towards you. Read about the serial killers. Read about the, 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 the dictators that slaughtered millions of their own kin. Read about the people that did this and did that. My father was a drunkard and he beat him. Read about Joseph Stalin. Read about his history. His father beat his mother to a pulp every night. You don't think that had an effect upon him and his iron fist in the Soviet Union? You think he, he had that type of look, outlook on life if his father didn't beat his mother up like that? And let's go on and on and on. So it's very important to be mindful of one's childhood. Be mindful of how you treat your children. Be mindful of what you show your children. Be mindful of what you expose your children to because it has a direct effect upon when they what? When they get older. So we ask Allah Azzawajal to allow us to understand this, allow us to implement this, allow us to practice this. Thank you very much for your patience. I know it was a long class, and I know many of you were probably expecting a lecture. I'm sorry to let you down and give you an actual dars and not a lecture. Please, you can forgive me for that. Jazakumullah khairan.